Welcome to the Red-Haired Archaeologist. I am your host, author, and sunscreen advocate, Amanda Hope Haley. Thank you for spending some time with me today, studying artifacts our first century Near Eastern ancestors left behind, and considering if those items just might change how we read or read into scripture. In the spring of 2019, it was about this time, maybe it was April or May of 2019, I was busy planning my trip to go to Israel so that I could write The Red-Haired Archaeologist Digs Israel. I had just finished and turned in my manuscript for my previous book, which was called Mary Magdalene Never Wore Blue Eyeshadow. And I was talking to a friend of mine named David Capes, and he suggested that while I was in Israel, I should make sure that I visited the site of Magdala. And it was something that had never occurred to me before. I didn't really know anything about Magdala. And I felt that I had spent a lot of time getting to know Mary Magdalene recently, mostly because of the intro to my book. I started the book by telling the story of how I learned at the age of 22, sitting in a divinity school class at Harvard. It was there that I learned for the first time that Mary Magdalene was not actually a prostitute. That is a tradition that I grew up believing wholeheartedly. And it was sort of a watershed moment for me because it made me realize just how much more difficult it is to realize what is not in the Bible versus reading what is in it. I think we as humans have a tendency to read in our experiences and our traditions. We put those things into the text even when they're not there. It's really hard to see, you know, what isn't present. The short form of the story goes that I was in this class and we were studying a non-canonical gospel called the Gospel of Mary. And it is basically the story of Jesus giving special knowledge to Mary, and she is trying to share the special knowledge with his apostles. And they're sort of having none of it. They don't have a whole lot of nice things to say about Mary. It's a fragmented gospel. There's lots of problems with it. But anyway, we're sitting in class, and the teaching fellow asked us, you know, hey, why do you think that the other apostles don't want to listen to Mary? Why don't they seem to believe that Jesus gave her the special knowledge, et cetera, et cetera? And I raised my hand very proudly, and I said, well, maybe it's because she was a prostitute. Another student who was in the class literally laughed out loud at me in that moment and looked me straight in the face and said, how did you make it into graduate school without knowing that Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute? This was an excellent question. (laughs) And it's a question that ended up sort of driving my career and driving me to do what I'm doing right now, and that's helping people realize what actually is in Scripture. And then what kinds of traditions and, in my particular case, how archaeology impacts how we understand scripture. Sometimes it contextualizes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. And Mary Magdalene, her reputation of being a prostitute, that is an example of how a longstanding tradition within Christianity has negatively impacted how we as Christians can view her character. Where did this idea come from? Why do so many people think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? The story goes that on September 14th, 1591, Pope Gregory gave a homily, as popes tend to do. And in that homily, and we actually have the text of it. You can look this up if you want. In that homily, he conflates Mary of Bethany, who was Lazarus' sister, Mary of Magdala, and the woman who washes Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7, right at the end of Luke 7, is when Jesus is sitting there and the woman comes in and washes his feet with a fragrant oil using her hair. That story. So he conflates all of these and decides that they're all Mary because Mary of Magdala and Luke appears for the first time literally in the next verse in Luke 8. Luke 8, verses 1 through 3, read that Jesus preached from city to city, village to village, carrying the good news of the kingdom of God. He was accompanied by a group called the Twelve, and also by a larger group, including some women, who had been rescued from evil spirits and healed of diseases. There was Mary, called Magdalene, who had been released from seven demons. There were others like Susanna and Joanna, who was married to a steward of King Herod, And there were many others also. These women played an important role in Jesus's ministry, using their wealth to provide for him and his other companions. Those three verses, that is the first mention of Mary Magdalene. 
and Pope Gregory, you know, was reading his Bible and he reads about this woman washing Jesus' hair. Literally, the next female name that pops up in the text is Mary of Magdala. And so he wanted to give a name, basically, to the woman who washed Jesus' feet and decided to tell everybody that they were the same person. Understand, in 1591, the Protestant Revolution is, depending on who you ask, they're either in the middle of it or it's over. Scholars disagree on the timing of that, but it's very much happening. And so when he was speaking, he was really speaking to a huge swath of Christianity. There weren't a whole lot of Protestants in the world at that point compared to the number of Catholics. He was considered to be God's representative on earth by the Catholics. And so anything he said, no one questioned. This is also a time when a lot of people are not literate. And this is a time when translations of the Bible from the Greek into the languages that other people were speaking into German, into English, all of that is just beginning. So even though there are some Bibles that are out there in a language that the average person speaks, odds are most of them aren't able to read for themselves anyway. And so what they hear from their Pope or what they are told that their Pope said is gospel in a way to them. So no one questioned him. And this story that he told, so he conflates these three women. And then he goes on to say that the seven demons that Jesus drove out of Mary of Magdala represented the seven vices. And that the perfume she used, or obviously not her, probably a different woman, but in his story, he says the perfume that she used to wash Jesus' feet, he said, and I quote here, she had previously used to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. So that's actually in the homily. Obviously, he would have said it in Latin. So this is a translation. That's the genesis of this whole idea that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. It's simply incorrect. And a lot of scholars will, especially feminist scholars, will spend a lot of time talking about his intentions in doing all of this. All of that is very, very debatable. but. That aside, the bottom line is he said this, and it did change how we looked at her character in the Bible. What we actually know about Mary from the scripture is that she was from Magdala. She was wealthy. She, along with those other women, bankrolled basically Jesus's ministry. She traveled along with him. And probably the most important thing about Mary of Magdala, especially as we're coming up on Easter, is that she is the only person, male or female, that all of the gospel writers agree was there to find Jesus' tomb was empty on Easter. Magdala as a city doesn't really get a whole lot of press in the Bible. We know that Mary was from Magdala, but that's pretty much it. Capernaum gets a lot more press when Jesus is in the region of Galilee doing his preaching. You hear about other cities a lot more, obviously, than you do Magdala. And so to learn anything about the city, it's important to turn to archaeology. Well, maybe because Magdala doesn't get a lot of press in the Bible, for whatever reason, the city was never excavated and it just sort of fell out of everyone's memory until a happy accident, basically, in 2009. So that's, what, 11, 12 years ago now. Some local contractors in the modern city of Magdala were preparing to dig the foundation for a new building. And they accidentally found what turned out to be the oldest synagogue that has ever been discovered in all of Galilee. There are actually only seven synagogues inside of Israel from this time period, this one being the seventh. So they were sort of rare to begin with, but then actually Magdala, its claim to fame now beyond being the home of Mary is this oldest synagogue. So at that point, the Israel Antiquities Authority came in, they partnered up with two Mexican universities, and they began digging in earnest. And in fact, later that year, the same year, Pope Benedict XVI actually went to Magdala and visited the site. It's a very active excavation right now. So when you go and you visit it today, you're going to have sort of a do-it-yourself kind of tour. They've done a really great job all around the site of posting these panels that have photographs, illustrations, lots of explanations 
of what the city was like back in Jesus's time and explaining to you what items they have found and all that. And so you have to do it yourself, um, but you can learn a lot there. As with a lot of excavations that are currently active and maybe the findings haven't been published yet, they do allow you to take photographs for yourself, but they ask that you not publish them. And so if you pick up a copy of my book, it is very sad to me that I was never able to get permission from the group to be able to publish any of the photographs there. So what you can do is go to their website, which is magdala.org, and they have a few things up there. But it seems what they really want is to encourage people to go and see for themselves what is happening there. What they have discovered is that Magdala first became a city around 200 BCE, about 200 years before Jesus was born. It was, as the Bible says, it was a wealthy fishing village by the time that Mary was born, assuming that she would have been born, you know, about the same time as Jesus. We don't really have an age on her. When you visit, the first thing that you're going to see is the oldest synagogue ever found in Galilee, as I mentioned. Then there's a large market area. There are large homes. Inside those homes and inside the public spaces, they have found frescoed walls and mosaic floors. And what they are turning up is to my eye, similar to what you see in Herod's palace in or palaces in Masada. These are very lavish decorations that are happening here. And then there's also four very high quality ritual baths that are there. And these things are amazing. I mean, you think, okay, it's a bath. It's basically a hole in the ground that has, you know, steps leading down into it. But so much engineering went into this back 200 years before Jesus was born, that they are actually supplied by flowing groundwater. And that is really important when Jews are taking ritual baths. It's important that the water be moving to keep it pure. And so these things naturally fill themselves from the groundwater. And to this day, when you walk around and you're taking a look at what they have dug up and what they've excavated, there is water in these pools and the water is moving. And um, that's just It's just the earth at work and um, some ancient, excellent engineering that went into the creation of these things. Where the synagogue is, the way they have dated a lot of this kind of stuff, they found some coins and the coins that are there range between 5 CE and 63 CE. And so one of the stories that they will tell you from the beginning is that it is entirely possible that Jesus would have literally taught inside that synagogue, which is sort of exciting to think about when you're standing there. In the center of the synagogue was discovered something that's called, that they have called the Magdala Stone. It's basically an ancient stone lectern, if you will. The rabbi who would have been speaking would have placed the sacred Jewish texts that he was working from on this stone while he was speaking. And the stone itself is incredibly ornate. It's carved and it is intended to represent the temple in Jerusalem. And so what you see on it is this large seven branched menorah is carved on one side. And on the top, there's this beautiful rosette design. And they will tell you that that was intended to represent the veil that would have been in front of the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem's temple at the time. Because keep in mind, when this was in use, the temple was still there. The temple wasn't destroyed until 70. So the top of it represents the veil. And then on the back side of it, there's a carving of a fiery chariot, which then represents the divine presence, which would have existed above the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies at that time. This is probably the prized possession for the folks at Magdala who have done the excavating, they have a replica there that you can look at. And um, it, it's incredible. I've never seen anything quite like it. But of course, for the Christian, it is especially poignant because you think about, you know, Jesus there teaching in the synagogue. Off to the side from that, there is a huge marketplace. As we know from the Bible, this is a wealthy trading area. And this marketplace had 20 separate rooms that had been excavated to this point. And inside those rooms, I mean, anything could have been sold. It could have been pottery. It could have been fabrics. It could have been different types of foods. I mean, anything you think of. I mean, just, you know, if you go to a farmer's market today and you walk around, we have, you know, stalls basically that are at least in the one we have here in town 
they're movable. But at Magdala, these were permanent areas in the marketplace. And so anything could have been sold from there. And of course, being right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, fish would have been a really common thing to find in that area. And within those 20 rooms, they actually found 40 separate pools that they're still debating what exactly these pools were. But the leading theory right now is that that's where the fish that were caught in the Sea of Galilee would be brought into Magdala, brought to the marketplace and held in these little pools until people came and bought them. So there, maybe there's so many because they're separated out by species or maybe there's so many simply because the fish were so abundant in the Sea of Galilee at that time. This was simply big business for the city. Based on the archaeology, life seems to have been really good in the city of Magdala. And it stayed that way until 67 CE. And like the fate of every place I feel like I have been talking about <laughs> this season, the Romans came in and they attacked and the city was deserted at that point. And so after it fell, it just laid there and erosion happened and everything that has been brought up by the excavation was only 30 centimeters below the surface. So for almost 2000 years, the city just laid there waiting to be found. And the modern city of Magdala is really taking this discovery and running with it. Magdala is not a big city. Um, it is not a bustling metropolitan area. When we were there, there was a crossroads and a strip mall. And I will say within the strip mall, there's this wonderful restaurant called Magdalena. And I think my husband and my parents, we all agreed that it was the best meal that we had the entire time that we were in Israel. So if you ever are there, seek it out. Yeah, this is a city that doesn't have a bustling tourist industry, you know, like some of the other cities in, in Israel does. And they're hoping to change that. And so some people have partnered with the excavation. They're coming in and they're building a retreat center in the area and hoping to really improve tourism, specifically focusing on Jews and Christians and having them come out and basically having this archaeological site as the draw for people to come and witness all of this. Also, then new hotels going up, place for people to stay. So they have like a full blown retreat center there. And they were working on it while we were there, but it, it looked like it was going to be really, really nice. So I suspect that in the future, a lot of these Christian tours that churches tend to go on, I expect Magdala is going to start popping up on some itineraries. And I encourage you to take advantage of it. If you ever had the chance to go, it's free. It didn't cost us a cent to go in there and take a look at everything. And we were there. Well, I read everything. If you're not a history lover, you probably never want to go to a museum or a site or anything like that with me because I will make you look at absolutely everything. I think we were there like maybe four hours. But you could probably, the average person would probably do the entire site in maybe an hour to an hour and a half, something like that. It's beautiful. It's cool. You feel the breezes coming off of the Sea of Galilee. All of the sea grasses are in between the city and the body of water. It's a gorgeous place to just go and take photographs and just think about the amazing history that happened there 2,000 years ago. If you enjoyed this episode of The Red-Haired Archaeologist, then I hope you will listen again soon. New episodes are released each Friday. To learn more about me, check out my website, redhairedarchaeologist.com. There you will find links to my books, this podcast, and my blog, where you can interact with me and other listeners. Also look for my new book, The Red-Haired Archaeologist Digs Israel. It is available now as a print book, ebook, and audiobook from all of your favorite retailers. 